something like a standard deviation or an average deviation from the mean or something along that line, that is a spread around that mean. Well, if I have a material, if I have a, 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 an item of matter that is now represented by a distribution of a wave, I want to know what the width of that wave is. That's going to give me a probability of where we might see this particle in space. So everything's going to be based on probabilities, averages, that's why I asked that. And so we're going to begin there. So the, our route here is we're going to talk a little, just the first two days, about probabilities, this and how we're going to use those. Uh, then we're going to build up, we'll do some classical mechanics, see how that works, and then tie that into uh, the spherical space, and then, then we'll use, the, we'll build the bore model of the hydrogen atom. Uh, Bohr nailed it as far as hydrogen atom energy levels goes, but he had no idea why. And it was missing a lot of different things. From there, we will introduce the new mechanics, the quantum mechanics, and we need some fundamentals. There's some mathematics we need to go through. It's not terribly difficult, but it's essential in doing that. But in this material, talk about snowballing much more than it ever did last semester. This is going to snowball crazy life. You have to get the stuff early. Now once you, you get those foundations early, then we're just going to be reusing them and reusing and reusing them when we talk about vibrations, when we talk about rotations and translations and then atoms and then molecules. We're going to use those same fundamentals over and over again. So you've got to get those down early. So a little, little point of uh, reference on that. Uh, one thing I do want to ask, um, before I kind of launch here. I have a schedule, but I recall someone mentioning that there was an ECF meeting yeah. in the later on. It's in March. Okay, yeah, if, I, I kind of tentatively put this down as March 30, I don't know what it is, but if you can get a date on that, because we're going to have a number, number of people going, we just won't have class on that day. But I want to make sure to organize the schedule around that. Well, so if you, if you got a date for me sometime, let me know. Okay. That'd be great. That'd be great. Okay. So we'll, we'll point a point of note on that. All right. The same Dropbox we've used. I didn't change anything. So we'll just use that and I've entered material in there. Okay. Now, probability. To do probabilities and averages and, uh, and all these and average squares and that whole business, there are going to be about three ways we're going to use it. One is if you just simply have data. So you have data. So the example of having data would be this example here, the best illustrated by example. So let's say I have you know a candidates coming in and they're going to be you know out of a population of humanoids, and there are going to be candidates to be Olympic shot players. Okay, so so when we, we have a number of people that come in and we say how many of these people will shot put throw the heavy 16 pound ball, one yard up to eight yards, okay? And then we count these number of values. So we'll have a number of people come in, and we found that 13 of them can throw the shot put one yard, uh, seven of them can do two, five can do three, three people can shoot four yards, two, two, one, and one for five, six, seven, and eight. So now I want to know some values from that. So these is called, this is called discrete data, and a lot of quantum mechanics will have that. Quantum mechanics is not going to have unless we formulate it. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. We, if we formulate continuous functions, and then we use them, that's what you did all last semester. You had fitted data into a function, and then you use those functions. But in some cases, we'll be able to do that. But in some cases, we're just going to have discrete data. We, we need to worry about instead of integrals, we'll be doing sums and stuff like that. So let's ask a couple of questions here. So let's assume that assume the candidates are sitting in a group. If an Olympic candidate should be able to throw at least six yards, that's our minimum, what is the likelihood that a candidate will be selected from the pool that can throw farther than five yards? Now I want to know what the average distance is for the throw, that's doing this right here, and then the average square distance. So that's going to have some significance in a moment. Now, what we're going to do, what we have to do, is always, when I have a probability function, 
we have to answer the question, what does it mean to have certainty in your probability? We did this with the maxwell boltzmann distribution last time. What we will say is that a, a value of one is a certainty. So any number less than one between zero and one is the fraction that we'll be interested in. To do that, we always have to normalize. So what we have to do is first calculate all the possibles. So we have, going from one to eight, I have, if I add up the number of people that came in from the trial, there's 34 of them. So the probability of throwing any particular distance is the number of people throwing that distance divided by all possible. So we had 34 people. And remember that we had, what was it, 13 that can throw it? Uh, one yard, yeah, 13 throw one yard. So if I have the probability of selecting someone at random that can throw the shot with only one yard, it's going to be 13 divided by all possible, which is all the number of people, 34. So you get about 0.382, or 38%. For the next group, I think the next one was seven, so you can throw the two yards, will it be seven over 34, so forth and so on. And if you add all these numbers together, they always add up to one, all right? So that is a certainty. What's the probability of selecting someone that can throw the shot with it all? <laughs> all right, that would be a certainty on that. So now if we want to you know how many of them can go five yards or greater, we just simply need to add those values from five, six, seven, eight, and uh, I think six, seven, and eight. So we have, we make a sum of the probabilities going from six to eight. So I just simply add that number, that number, that number together. So we find out about 0.118 would be the probability. So I have 34 people, I select one at random, I have an 11.8% or 0.118 fraction of having them being able to throw greater than five yards. So now we do the distances, and you're, I'm not going to withdraw anybody because you answered the question correctly. So we do what we had done all last time. We say, what is the average for the, a discrete set of data? We have our probabilities. We, have, we know those now. So I take the probability of going one yard, multiply by the, uh, the, the distance of one yard. So this would be, what was it, 0.38? Or what was that number? So we had 0.382. So I have 0.382 times one yard. And then I add to that this point, the next one is 0.206 times two yards, then 0.147 times three yards, and so forth. So the average of all contestants that threw is about 2.676 yards. We want to also, you'll see the significance of this, want to know the average square distance. So that's now doing this with a square in here, which is different than that. This is the average value squared. This is the average square. Okay? They are different. So when you do the average square, we do the same thing, except where we want we have an x squared in there, and then we're y in this instance. It's y squared. And then again, times the probability. So we have your 0.386 times one squared, and then 0.206 times two squared, so forth and so on. So the average square distance then is about 10.853. Now notice square yards on that. So we'll need to do that. Now, the other things that we will need, and this one is going to become significant. We'll, I'll explain why. Uh, the average square deviation is what is, so what we do is we take the each particular distance or, or fraction, multiplied by, or excuse me, subtracting the average, square it, times the probability. That's called the average square deviation. In quantum mechanics, you may have heard this term before, of Heisenberg uncertainty. We're gonna be calculating, when we finally develop waves of matter, we're gonna to want to know the spread in that way where the uncertainty. So I said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have, okay, this particle is at 10 meters out, but it's gonna have an uncertainty. You know, it's not, it's not, we can't say it's at 10 meters. We can always say it's 10 meters plus or minus something. And so the uncertainty statistical value we will use will be this. Now, when we do that, 
if I simply expand that, what I'm going to do is take this summation, I'm going to take this and square it. When I get when I square this, I'm going to have x of i squared times probability. Then I'm going to have x average squared times a probability. And then of course minus 2 times x i x average times a probability as well. So it's just simply squaring those and, and distributing those out. If I then distribute the sums, a sum of a sum of sums is uh, you know you can you can break up the sums individually. So I have this first term, this x of i squared probability, the second term, x average probability, and then of course the third term, minus two, I'll pull the two out, x i x average probability. Now, this value here is the square average. Okay? So that is actually x value squared. So I represented it here as x squared. I put some for average the best way that I can do it in math cat. This value here, this is a constant because it is the average. So this can be pulled out of the summation sign, just leaving a sum of just the probabilities. When you add up all the probabilities, you just get one. All right? So the first term becomes your x average, or x squared square average, <laughs> then this becomes x average squared, and then in the same vein, I have the two here, this x average can come out, then I have a summation of x of i probability, well that is just, this is the average. So this ends, ends up being x squared average, plus x average squared, minus two times x average, and x average is x average squared, you bring that down, then we get a simpler variant of the, uh, the, the, what will be the uncertainty or square deviation. So what we'll do, we'll be doing this a lot. We're gonna take this square, we're gonna find the average of a value squared, average of the square value, minus the average squared, and that will be, then the square deviation, what we can call later, that will be uncertainty in the weight function. Okay. Well, we have those values calculated above. I already did that up here. So there's my average distance, 2.676. There's my average square distance, 10.853. So when I just simply say, well, the average square deviation around the mean is the average square distance here minus the average distance squared, and I get a value of 3.689 yards. Okay, So that's going to be the spread. Uh, of in that. So we'll learn a lot about the, uh, the particles and the matter and, and things like that from that. So again, okay, that will be, we'll, we'll see how Heisenberg comes into that. Uh, one other one that we commonly use, we will not use it as much, but it's worth noting here, of course, is the standard deviation. I don't know if you know this, and people, sometimes that's, it's taught, sometimes it's not, but a standard deviation usually has two different forms. One is standard deviation divided by n, where we have the x minus x average squared over n, square root, you've probably seen. This is one you've probably seen here. It's xi minus x average squared over n minus one. The difference between those, if you have a sample, and you do your, your measurements on that sample, you do your averages and all that business, the standard deviation of the sample itself is divided by n. Here's what we want to do. If we have a sample, we're presuming that that sample is representative of a population. So if I measure a, you know, the average weight of 100 people, or something along that lines, then I would do the same weight or whatever measurement that there is, I'll have a standard deviation of the sample. If I want to get a standard deviation of the rest of the world, that's the population. So the sample of the population has an n minus one to go with that. So if I have just a unique sample, all I'm interested in is that sample, I'm not interested in representing the, the rest of the world, then I have that standard deviation there. Most of them is the n minus one. This is, this is a statistics argument. The statisticians have a little bit of boom math as they go with it, but it works. But on average, you'll find that the population will be larger. And just to kind of see a, there's a little bit of discussion of why you have an n minus one, and when you would use the n or n minus one within here. 
And just as doing a sample in here, here's kind of a, a, an example of this. What I've done here is I've used a random number generator in MATCAD, and I have 10,000 measurements, okay? So I have 10,000 measurements, and I selected from 10,000 random numbers, 20, okay? So the average, then, of the population is a random number of that 10,000 is 20.03. So the standard deviation of that entire thing, we'll say, let's say that, that is everything. Let's say there's only 10,000 of whatever these things are in the universe. The standard deviation of that sample is about 3.985. Now what I did is I randomly took a subset of those, okay? By the way, this is P, that's the number of data points. 20 is the average that I wanted, and four was the standard deviation that I wanted. That's, that's how that is written. But what I did, I said, okay, of those 10,000, now I'll say I have, I've got enough time to measure 10,000 things. So I'm only gonna measure 10 of that population. Well, I take 10, that's what I did here. I took a subset, I took 10 of that 10,000. Now here, here's the distribution here to show you it is, it is a kind of a random Gaussian style distribution. So I took 10, and so now I took the population, or the sample. Now this is now a subset of the 10,000. And I did a standard deviation of the sample. Notice the value is 2.935, it is less than the population. That's always going to be the case, all right? So if I have my sample, and I do a standard deviation of that, relative to the rest of the world, the number's gonna be smaller. So that's why we do, we divide by n minus one. The n minus one makes that number larger and closer to then the, the population. So it's just a little bit of a, a, a note on standard deviations you might have, not have heard before, okay? All right, now what we're also going to do is we're gonna be looking at combined probabilities. Very often we're going to have, you know, particles that could have two different possible quantum states they could be in. We want to know what's the probability of two particles being in that in either of those quantum states. But we have to be very careful in our choice of words. Our words are going to be and and or is how we phrase this. So if we have an event A and an event B, and I want to calculate the probability of seeing event A or event B, A or B, we then take the probability of, the, of event A, we take the probability of event B, and we add them, okay? So here's an example. So here are the following blood types and probabilities in the general U.S. population. This is from, uh, I think, the Red Cross. So we have blood types, O positive, O negative, A positive, A negative, so forth and so on. The probability of people on Earth uh, of that blood type is about 0.37 or 37% are, are O positive, 6% are O negative, 34% are A positive, and so forth and so on. So I say, okay, I, there's a clinic here, there's, there's a poor little patient that's having trouble, and a donor is needed to provide blood to a patient having the A positive blood type, okay? Now, an A positive blood type can receive blood from a donor of A positive or AB positive. So if you're gonna have a donor, it has to be either A positive or AB positive. So someone walks in, what's the probability of having A positive or AB positive? So what we do is we take the probabilities of A positive, which is 0.34, and then AB positive, which is 0.04, we add them together. So there's a 38% chance that someone walking through the door with those statistics will have, you'd be a potential donor for that, okay? Now, if we use the word, that's the word or, if we use the word and, then the probabilities are multiplied. So either or, you add, and you then multiply. So 
we go down a little further. So here's the continual patient. I said, all right, said, our poor patient in the previous example is much more trouble than we originally thought. It seems that a single donor will not be sufficient to watch too much blood. So a second potential donor walks in. In this instance, it happens to be the, don the donors from the Asian population. And again, the American Red Cross, it says among Asian Americans are the following blood type probabilities that are slightly different. So for the type prob probability in the Asian, it goes 0 0.39, 0 0.01, 0 0.27, following a positive, a negative, as we had up above. So I want to know what is now the probability of having two patients walk in the door and both of them being able to donate. Not an or, but now and. So they both have to be able to donate. So we then multiply. Well, first, here is the probability for this second donor. We do the same thing we did before. We have 0.39 plus 0.07, so 0.46 if either being A positive or AB positive. Now we take the first probability, which is 0.38, and the second probability, which is 0.46, and we multiply them. So that, now that uses the word and. So and the probability that both can donate is the 0.38 times 0.36 or 0.17, so it's a significantly reduced amount on that. This follows very much problem number one. We've got problem one, two, and three, and they, they're not difficult. Uh, and problem number one, I just simply have a representative that this is very, very similar to the shot put example. I have a large box that contains a number of rods of different lengths, and I have lengths going from 10, 12, 13, 15, 18, 22, and 25 centimeters. And the number of rods in the, of each of those lengths in the box, now mix all together, there's 11 of a length 10 centimeters, there's 14 of a length 12 centimeters, 12 of a length 13 centimeters, and so forth. Then I ask a number of questions. I say, compute the average length of the rods in the box. Okay, so that means you have to, for each one of those, we say, all right, how many rods are there? You add up the number. So we have 11 plus 14 plus 12 plus 13, and so forth and so on. And so the probability of pulling a rod of length 10 would be 10 over the total. Probability, of course, that will be normalized then. So the average length, of course, is what we had done up above. We say, how many rods of length 11 times the probability of having a length of uh, 10, rather. Then we have, add to that, the probability of, of rods of length 12 times 12, then the probability of rods of length 13 times 13, and so forth and so on. Exactly as we did the, the, the shot put example up above here. So it goes, goes exactly, you know, like we did our averages. Here's our average here. So we have the probability again times the value. So you get the probabilities first and multiply times the value. Well, then further up, I have an additional question. So what are the odds of randomly selecting a rod of length of 15 centimeters? Okay. Well, now that is just a you know, you have 50, there's 13 of the rods of the total will have a length of 15 centimeters, so it's simply that probability. So you probably you already have calculated that actually in A. And then we go to, what are the odds of randomly selecting a rod of length 13 centimeters or 22 centimeters? So you take the probability of 13, probability of 22, and you simply add them together, okay? Following the and or scheme. And then in D, we have to be a little bit careful that this is more elucidated in the next problem. So what are the odds of randomly selecting a rod of length 18 centimeters and then immediately after selecting a rod of length 25 centimeters? Here you gotta be a little bit careful because once you pull a rod of 18 centimeters out of the box, now the probabilities change because the number of rods in the box is less by one. In, in, in that length of 18 centimeters. So once you pull that 18, you got a probability for that, you'll renormalize and then do a probability for 22 centimeters. This is illustrated in this next example here. Here's our blood types in here. Here is an example that kind of uses that. There are 98 tiles in a scrabble set, not including the blanks, 
And included in that Scrabble set, there's 12 letters E, four letters S, four blocks with letter D, and four blocks with letter L. So I want to know what is the probability of drawing the letters necessary to spell the word seedless in order. So you reach into the bag, you pull out an S. You reach into the bag, you pull out an E. In order. Okay. So the first one, again, of 98 tiles, that's the total. The probability of drawing S on the first draw, there's four letters S. So it's 4 over 98 or 0.041. That's your probability. So now, just as in the Rod's problem, we've now reduced our number by 1. So the probability of drawing a letter E on the next draw is we still have 12 letters E. So it's 12, but it's over 97 now. Okay, so now it's 0.124. Following along in this, in this strategy, now we have another E. Well, then E, we've now reduced the number, we have 12, now we only have 11. So now it's 11, again, now over 96, because we pulled two of the blocks out. So it gets 11 over 96. And then we have a D, well, we still have four Ds, so it's four over 95. And then an L, so we still have four Ls, four over 94. And then uh, we get another E, which is now 10 over 93. And another S, 3 over 92. Now we pulled another S out of 2 over 91. So since we're doing an and now, we have, to have this and this and this and this, we multiply all those together. So we combining, we take the probability of 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, and we're all the particular reference letters. So we have the odds of pulling out that word in order is 7.9 times 10 to the minus 11, not like that's going to happen. All right. Now let's do this. We'll be seeing this later. This is going to be a very, very, very important thing we see later. So the number of possible combination tiles that allow word seed to be produced must be calculated. I want to know, to count for days or use a convenient expression in combinatorial analysis, the the number of possibilities of having the word seedless is the number of possible tiles uh, or, or of letters in the word divided by number of letters S factorial, number of letters E factorial, D factorial, and L factorial. Again, we will deal with this later. So if I want to say what are the probabilities of pulling out uh, those eight letters but not necessarily in order. Well, we have all the possibilities. Well, there's a possibility that I pulled an E first, and then an S, and then the rest of the word. And then I probably, you know, there's a possibility I pulled a D first, then an S, and E. In other words, we have all these possible combinations that will add up to the word seedling. So that is calculated through this. Again, we're not going to worry too much about that now. You will see later where it has a lot more significance. So the number of possible ways to pull the blocks out is 1,120 to spell the word seedless. So the, each probability is 7.99 times 10 to the minus 11 times 1120. So the probability is better, but not great. So it's, it's 8.947 times 10 to the minus 8. So they use the word and more than anything else. Now, I want to look at problem number two. In problem number two, we have that we have three reporters for a newspaper, Jim, John, and Bob, okay? Now, Jim gets the facts right 80% of the time. So we have Jim, 0.88. John gets the facts right 80% of the time, so 0 0.80. Then we have Bob, Poor old Bob, he only gets him right 55% of the time. So this is the odds of getting it correct. Okay. This is very subtle, so it, it, let's focus on this one. I want to know first, what is the probability that Jim and John, when investigating, will get the facts of the story correct? Okay? So that is an and statement. So we have the probability Jim gets it correct is 0.88. Probability that John gets it together is 0 0.80. We simply multiply those two probabilities together. Okay, that is the and work on that. Okay? So for this, it's very simple. Now, Jim and John each cover the story independently and submit stories that agree 
as to the facts. Very, very important, very subtle distinction. Now I ask, what's the probability that Jim and John, when investigating, get the facts of the story correct? Here's what has happened. Let's look at all our possibilities. So, right, correct, and wrong, okay? So we have Jim and John, okay? So right is you know, 0 0.80. Well, let me do this way. Um, let me give it a table I don't outline the way I did it. So I'm giving it clear. Let's do it this way. Let me do it slightly different. Um, so we have Jim Wright, John Wright. Okay. Then we have Jim right, John wrong. I'll just put these W and R. Then we have Jim wrong, John right, and then finally Jim wrong and John wrong. So those are all the possibilities. When we did the part A, all of these possibilities were in place, okay? Now, what we have done, and believe this or not, nature works this way. It's, a, it's a most, one of those fascinating and quizzical things about nature. You make a measurement on a quantum system, the probabilities of it being in a particular state change, just simply by measuring, just by looking at it. You're gonna see the weirdest things. Come into that. When we did this value where we simply multiplied those two numbers together, all of these were in play. Now, since they agree as to the facts, Jim Wright, John Wrong, Jim Wrong, John Wright are no longer possible. Okay? So what we have to do is renormalize. So Jim Wright, John Wright, with this is the 0.88. 0 0.80, then wrong and wrong would be 0 0.12, right? 0 0.88, you know, minus 1, 1 minus 0 0.88, and 0 0.20. These possibilities are not possible. So you multiply that number together, multiply that number together, add them up, that is renormalized. We made a measurement. Making a measurement changes the probabilities. So now the probability that they are both correct is this number that you calculated at A divided by now your new normal. Okay? And so you get a slightly different number out of that. So it's important to recognize what happens when you do make a measurement. Now in part C, <coughs> the editor wishing to confirm sends Bob's story. And Bob's facts also agree with those of Jim and John. Okay, so now we have more probabilities, or more possibilities. We have Jim right, John right, Bob right, Jim wrong, John wrong, Bob wrong, and those are the only two. You can't have any other, because all of them agree as to the facts. So you have Jim right, John right, Bob wrong is not possible. Okay, so you just look at it. So I get the probability that they're all correct, and now we're going to have three, this number times this number times this number. What's the probability of them being all wrong? Of course, it's now 0.12 times 0.2, now 0.45. You see, that's your new normalization. So you get all correct divided by that new number, and that's your probability. And then I twist it again. It said if Bob's facts had disagreed with Jim and John, what was the probability as a fact reported, Jim and John are correct. Well, now you're going to do the very same thing, but this possibility where they're all correct and the possibility where they're all incorrect are no longer the case. You can either have only this case, Jim's right, John's right, Bob's wrong, Jim's wrong, John's wrong, Bob's right. The, to calculate those probabilities, add them together, that's your new normal. Okay? So making measurements is a significant thing. So that's that problem. And then it's kind of just a little kind of cute one that's done in problem number three. And this one was done in Parade Magazine in 1997. 
where they had to have this Marilyn Boss savant, and people would ask questions. Now, Mr. Jones is known to have two children. You're told in advance that at least one of Mr. Jones' children is a boy. That has made a measurement. You make a measurement, things change. Now, I'll illustrate that in just a moment. So, what is then the probability that both children are boys? Off the cuff, the usual answer is 50 50, right? That's not true. All right? There's the possibilities. You have boy, 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 girl, girl, boy, and girl, girl. Each of these, now those each are <coughs> having a boy or a girl is 50 50. So the probability of this is 0 0.50, 0 0.50. And similarly down in each of these cases. However, if a measurement was made, as in this case, one of them is a boy, this possibility doesn't exist. See, so you're gonna have a 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, multiply those together, add them, that's your normal, your normalization. Okay? Then the probability of uh, the other one being a boy is that number divided by that total. And you get a number of two thirds or one third or something like that rather than 50 50. If I had asked the question this way, okay, uh, Mr. Jones is known to have two children. His first child is a boy. What's the probability that the second child is a boy? Now it's 50 50. Right? It's very, very subtle because, in one instance, we don't know if his first child or the second child is a boy. We just know just one of them was. But by asking a more specific question or giving more specific information, the first one is a boy, now changes the odds. We're going to have to deal with this quantum mechanics a lot. Because, because once we make a measurement, and that's part of the uncertainty principle that comes into play, but it's going to be a fascinating thing is that we're going to find quantum systems are in what we call superposition. They can have many, they could be in many quantum states simultaneously. We don't know what it is until we make a measurement. The, the thought on this, or the philosophy on this, and the study on this goes deep enough that it is argued that you can change a quantum system by thinking about it. I mean, it's really it's out there stuff. You can actually change a quantum system by considering, considering it. I don't know how true that is, but a lot of people, very, very smart people, argue that. <clears throat> and uh, so, anyway, so those those are the problems one, two, and three. Just kind of dealing with you know probability and measurements and, and how that alters things. Uh, this one is kind of fun, and I, I, I may come back to this. There's one more thing I want to do here before that. But this is called uh, the Monty Hall problem. Just uh, statisticians love this problem. Anybody remember the Let's Make It Healer seen in the modern old version of it? It's a show, or it's a game show, and they pick someone out of the, the audience at random. And there's and where, you know, one of the common things is there's three doors on stage. And the the audience member or the contestant is asked to select a door with going to be a prize behind it, right? So the, the, uh, the contestant picks door number three or something along that line. Then the host turns to and he opens one of the other doors. Now the doors, one of them has a prize and two of them have like a dump heap or something, you know, some, some dud thing, right? So he, he says, all right, Contestant picks door number three. He opens one of the other doors and shows that it is a donkey. Then he turns to the contestant and asks, do you want to keep your door or do you want to switch to the other unopened door? And it turns out by numbers, when you do this statistically, they have a random number and everything like that. If the contestant switches, 
the contestant will win two thirds of the time. Rather than being a 50 50 shot now, because a measurement was made. It's kind of, it's, it's how that, and so this is kind of a fun problem. I got a couple of links. Most of the links have kind of died and kind of moved on a little bit. But it's a fun, if, if this is just a discussion of it. Uh, but I, I still have the links there. Yeah, in here, just play it. You know, go, you can go to one of these things. And there's the Monty Hall problem. And this one actually has several. Let's see if I have one of these. Uh, let's see if this one still works. Yeah, so here, play the game. So you say, all right, you, you pick a door. You know, so I, I pick number one. So now you open up door number three, and of course it's a you know, machine or whatever that is. So should you switch or should you not? What do you think? So if I switch, I'll switch to door two, I win the car. <laughs> so you do this over and over again. Now here are some numbers. Now previous, you know, when they've done this and collected it on the web. So those that switched, you've got the number of players that had played at 261, 175 winners. Those that didn't switch, there's 276 played that, 85 winners. And when you look at the percentages, it's about two thirds, one third. So anyways, it's kind of a fun little uh, deal that statisticians love to do on that. Okay, uh, one more thing. All right. I mentioned that when we have discrete data, we saw how to do averages. Well, value times the probability, or the average square, the average value squared times the probability, so forth and so on. What we would like to do in many instances is to represent that data with a function. But there's two ways we can do it. We can represent the data by a discrete function, which will be very common in quantum mechanics. Or, if the data is smooth enough, we can represent the data by a continuous function. So one is modeling after a function. Well, the first one is a discrete value problem. So this follows what we've done. For the probabilities that I gave above for the shot clutters, it turns out that just, I guess I'm kind of working empirically, I just made this up. It turns out that this function 100i over i plus one, where now i is an integer, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, where i is an integer, follows roughly this function here. So if I say, all right, the sum, if I add, if I evaluate this for i one through eight, and I add up all those probabilities, I get a sum of 34.324. Well, the number I had up above was 34. So that's pretty close, okay? So there is my normalization. So the probability, again, selecting a shot putter, one yard, two yards, three yards, or whatever, is the value, which is now I1, I2, I3, I4, and so forth, divided by the sum, 34.324. So the probability is doing it that way becomes 0 0.364, 0 0.216, 0 0.137. And you see, here's the data from above. Okay, that's what I started off at the very top of the page. You can see they're, they're reasonably close to each other. Well, now if I have a function that gives me the probabilities, then I can just do exactly what we had done before. So I said, what's the probability of a shot putter growing three greater than five yards? I do a sum from six to eight. Well, now I, have, I use my, my function that I built in there. And I get a value point one, two, three, which is not too different from what we had up above. The average is done exactly the same way. I take the value times the probability, and now it's a function, okay? Add them up from one to eight, I get my average distance. The average square distance is the same way. I take my probability times the distance squared, add all that up, 11.467 square yards, and then the average square deviation, just like we had done up above, is the average square distance minus the average distance squared, I get a 3.871, which is fairly close, okay? So we're gonna come across some instances where we'll have a function that we'll have to treat as discrete, and we're gonna have to do summations of probabilities based on that, okay? The third way, which we'll do next time, is representing the function as a continuous function. This is tricky. Every time you look at a quantum system, I'm going to ask the question, how close are the quantum levels to each other? 
Are they far apart or are they very, very close together? Here's the deal. When we're doing sums, if you have a function, sums turn into integrals. Okay? So integrals will derive from sums. But you have to have this. If I have a set of quantum values, and they look like this. We discussed it a little bit before, but we need to kind of reiterate it. So here's a set of quantum values that look like this. Something like that, maybe. Okay? Now, this would be represented by the fun, by that function we just looked at, but that is discrete. I have a value for this, 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 and this. I can use my averages. If I want to treat this as a continuous function, rather than the discrete one like I've done, then I would have a function that kind of looks like this. That's continuous. But here's the problem. If I do an integral now of this continuous function, the integral is going to include that area, that area, that area, that area, and that area. In other words, it's going to incur error. If, however, the quantum levels look like this, If they are very, 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 very close together, then if I represent this by a continuous function, I have more down here, then I'll get very, very, very little error. So every time we look at a quantum system, I'm going to want to know, does a quantum system look like this, or does a quantum system look like this? If it looks like this, I can replace the data. I can make an integral out of it, or make a function out of it. I can integrate it normally. Life is good. We're going to find out that for motions, and we'll get it later, for motions, translational motion quantum states are infinitely close to each other. Very, 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 very tight. Okay? So for quantum translation molecules moving around the room, bumping into the walls, that can be represented by a smooth function, and we will get extremely good data, good answers. That's why when we looked at the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, why it works so well. That's a classic, not a quantum system of Maxwell Boltzmann, but we got extremely good answers. When we did heat capacities, remember we did this. We had this for, we had this 3 halves R plus 3 halves R. We had this 3N minus 6 R. Remember doing that whole thing that didn't walk at This was horrible. Well, that's because vibration quantum states are this far apart. Translation was perfect, nearly perfect, because their quantum states are this far apart. Rotation is somewhere in the middle. We'll have to kind of negotiate what do we do with that. Right? But that's where we're going and why we need to evaluate this. So when we come back, we'll do the continuous functions. Uh, let's say we'll do a couple of quick intervals out of that. And then there's going to be, this is not a course that requires differential equations, but there's going to be three we're going to see a lot of, and they're easy to solve, and I'm just simply showing you the answers to them and how to solve them. So we'll do that on Wednesday. And we will meet you here for lab tomorrow. All right, I'll give you all the data on that. So I'll be putting you in, there's 12 of us, I'll be putting you into four groups of three. So I'll be thinking about that as well.